Welcome to the Sales Development Podcast, your trusted resource for the latest strategies, tactics, and tips on running a high-performance sales development program. Sales development has grown to become a critical part of the success of high-growth companies, and we dive in each week on how to specifically make your program successful and accelerate your career advancement. Subscribe at iTunes, YouTube, and jump on the newsletter over at 10bound.com to make sure you never miss an episode. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very excited about our next guest, Mr. Sean Fowler, VP of Enablement over at SalesLoft. This is going to be an awesome conversation. Sean, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dave. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm so excited that you could join us. You know, enablement is a hot topic when it comes to, especially our audience, is, is sales development, but across the sales team. I mean, it, what you do is so critical and um, excited to dive in. Sean, if folks are not familiar with you or with SalesLoft, tell us, how did you get into this and what brought you to SalesLoft? Yeah, so I joined SalesLoft about two and a half years ago. For those of you who might not be familiar with what SalesLoft is, it's, it's sales software that, that helps you have more conversations and turn those conversations into customers and renew those customers, right? It basically helps you track how you engage with your customers across the entire life cycle and helps you have more effective conversations and doing it. Your audience knows what sales left is though, right? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> if not, shame on you. Yeah. <laughs> I joined SalesLoft about two and a half years ago and took on the sales enablement lead role. Before that, I was at, at IBM. I'm sure you guys have probably heard of IBM before as well. And I actually ended up there on accident. I worked for a company called SilverPop that made marketing software. And I started out in training and then went into a sales engineering role and had a variety of, of sales roles before it was acquired by IBM. And I, I learned a lot at IBM. I enjoyed my time there. I actually was kind of like, getting a, an MBA in sales while I was there. But I like smaller companies. I like building something. I like having a seat at the table where I can have like a real effect on the trajectory of the company. And I'd been watching Kyle Porter build sales loft via LinkedIn basically for a few years at that point. And I, I knew that's the kind of place I wanted to be. And so when the opportunity came up, I, I jumped at it and it's, it's been incredible so far. You know, if you're in sales enablement, this is the best kind of company to work at because I get to teach salespeople to sell sales software to other salespeople. I get to study sales all the time, <laughs> right? And it's, it's an incredible Amazing. situation to be in. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, there's so many, you know, converging streams there of different cool things that are happening. And it has been amazing to you know, to see the development of software from just a few years ago when you just only ha really had Salesforce, you know, to, to organize everything. There was nothing like what SalesLoft does to, to keep you on track and organize. So it has been interesting to see that develop. Yeah, it has. It has. It's been a fun ride to be on so far. That's amazing. So with the experience that you've had, as you look at enablement, you know, what kind of programs do you run at SalesLoft and how do you work with the salespeople to, you know, give them the tools that they need to succeed? Yeah, I break enablement up into three different phases, right? Phase one is onboarding. And with onboarding, you really want to give people a strong enough foundation that they can be as productive as quickly as possible and then learn as quickly as possible the actual day-to-day -day execution of, of their job, right? And you have to make sure they've got a foundation to do that effectively. For us, we have a three-week onboard. It was a three-week in-person onboarding program. It's not anymore. We have a three-week onboarding program that's focused first and foremost on understanding sales skills and market knowledge. And I focus on those things first because I don't care how much you know about the product until you understand why someone would need our product and how you can effectively help them become aware of that, right? So product knowledge is actually kind of secondary to me. We get to it in the final week, but even then you're learning product knowledge within the context of how to demo the product or how to talk about different parts of the products to different personas that we sell to, right? Because if you don't understand that, you can't have a very effective conversation. The last part of that foundational knowledge is, is organizational knowledge. You know, who do I ask to get this done? How do I get this approved? Where do I find this? Things like that, right? So we handle all that during the onboarding phase. 
And then we hand them over to their managers. And the manager largely owns the next phase, which is ramping which is getting you up to speed, learning to do the day-to-day activities of your job, things like that. And there's some nuance to the manager ownership there that I'll get into in a minute at SalesLoft. The final phase is is ongoing education, right? And for most of the ongoing education, I look at funnel metrics to figure out where the problem is and then figure out what type of problem is it. Is it a sales skills problem? Is it a market knowledge problem? Is it a product knowledge problem? Or is it an organizational problem? And then based on figuring out where the problem is, and what type of problem it is, I then try to say, okay, which of my assets am I going to use to help solve this problem? And I've got five things at my disposal there. I've got process, I've got training, I have messaging, I have tools, and I have content. And I actually look at them in that order of importance. Process is actually the most important thing that I can do from an enablement perspective, and content's the the least important one. You know, if you if you can't close a deal because you didn't have a one pager, you probably have the wrong job. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> so interesting, though, because so I think what you run into a lot in the sales world is that people lead with the product. Like when they get you on a call, they want to talk about the product. And where you start is more, let's understand the world of the people that we're actually getting involved with. And then we'll back into the product. Is that correct? When in it the is. onboarding stage, yeah, yes. Yeah, you just when you get to the product, you're, I mean, the product is very important. But understanding what kind of problems the product solves is more important. And when people start with product, they usually end with product, and they never really get beyond it. A lot of times, it's it's the most tangible thing. It's the easiest thing to gravitate to. So they typically get hung up on it and. The reality is nobody wants to buy your product. They want to buy an outcome that your product enables. And for most software, what people really want to buy is an effective process that drives that outcome. And your technology just happens to enable that, the execution of that process, right? So if you don't understand people's processes, their current processes and the processes they would need to get to that outcome, then you're not going to be able to provide any value in the conversation. It's a hard thing to get people to wrap their head around because people want fast and easy, but fast and easy is not going to serve you very well. You hit a limit really fast on on fast and easy. You're going to have to be smart. You're going to have to understand business. You're going to have to understand, you know, the challenges of the people who you talk to and what they're doing to solve those challenges and what words they use to talk about those challenges. And, you know, those are all the things that you really need to understand to effectively sell. And so I want to spend as much time as possible on that. And that vocabulary. Now, I think people struggle in that case, especially newer sales people that are coming in. They struggle because you can chop down on the product. You can talk about the product because the product is something that you can learn, you know, right there. Whereas trying to get into the world of the person that you're engaging with is much broader and more complicated, right? And and it takes a lot of time to understand that. Plus, you might be calling into different verticals that have different vocabulary and things like that. So do you ever find that they just sort of get so overwhelmed with trying to learn the, the world of the people that they're calling that they just kind of revert back to talking about the product? Some of that. Oh yeah, that definitely happens, right? That's a constant, that's a constant struggle, frankly, in enablement, in in my opinion, is getting people to stay focused on the high value conversations. People want to get in the weeds. People want to talk about the product because it's the easiest thing to do. It's the safest feeling thing to do for them. And it requires less of you, typically. I do think, you know, especially if you're selling into different verticals, it can represent more of a challenge. But I try to focus on the business challenges themselves and then who cares about those challenges and how the product relates to those challenges. If you can get people to focus on the business challenges, I I find it's a lot more easy to digest the the content that you want people to understand by formatting it that way. Okay. So so if someone's out there, I mean, a lot of people don't have sales enablement or don't have enablement, uh, you know, or someone like you you (laughs) on their side. But they want to, they don't get any training. A lot of people get into the SDR job with no training at all. It's just they're on their own. How do you go about, you know, training the folks that are coming right in? They might have had a liberal arts degree. You know, they're coming in. Now it's their first couple of weeks. How do you go taking someone like that and, and giving them a basic, 
you know, framework of business issues and the pain points and things like that? And is there anything that somebody could do if they don't have those, you know, any support like you? Yeah, a couple things. You know, it's it's interesting. Before coming to sales lofts, I had two previous sales enablement positions. One was a silver pop. And I was the the first sales enablement person at Silver Pop. And I joked that it worked because we got bought like a year after I, got, I started doing that. Nice. And, I, and I did that for a little while for the Silver Pop brand at IBM. And then I took an international sales role. And then I ended up taking over sales enablement for that business unit at IBM. And so it was, it was interesting because I had a team of, of 50-something people that were in sales enablement. And we had 20-something different products. And some of those were massive products, right? But... I was training people who had been in sales for 20 years or 10 years, you know? So there were some things that I could skip over when I was doing the training. When I came to sales loft, you know, I'm training people who they were a waiter a year and a half ago, you know, or they were, they were taking final exams six months ago sometimes because they're the entry level SDRs and they've got the skills and they've got the intelligence. One of the things that we do really, really well, at sales loft is we hire really high quality talent. I've been consistently impressed with the talent that we bring in the door, but they don't have a lot of context or knowledge about sales. So in the past, I focused a lot on market knowledge and product knowledge. Now I've realized, well, pretty quickly, I realized I have to teach them sales skills. I have to teach them like how to do a discovery call. I have to teach them the psychology of sales. I have to teach them like all those foundational things and once I realized that, we started getting into like, here's how you role play this. We'll, we'll give people some examples of things to do. And then we just role play and role play and role play. And there's a lot of mock cold calls. And we play games where like there's certain pieces of information that are there on a slide. Actually, we put it up in the room and the person who's doing the role play has to leave. And everybody else is looking at the data on the, on the slide that's being projected on the screen. And they get graded on how much they uncover. You know, we do some interesting things like that in order to get people used to exercising those skills. Because the, the reality is you're not going to learn that stuff unless you just practice it over and over and over again. It is a, it is a hard thing that we're asking them to do because we're, we're asking, you know, people who may have not been business majors. And like you said, they, they were doing other things right before they <laughs> joined your enablement group. And now we're asking them to call on people with 10 or 20 years of experience mm-hmm. in their industry. You know, how do we bridge that gap in a way that gives people confidence to pick up the phone and, you know, engage with people like that? My favorite, my favorite part of onboarding. Well, one of my favorite parts, there's a few sessions that I do that I really, really enjoy, but one of them is called the five types of discovery questions. And we walk through like all the things you can do in discovery. And then we walk through the different types of discovery questions. And I say like, you know, everything kind of falls into five different categories. You can qualify, you can gather information, you can differentiate, you can establish pain, and you can establish credibility. And I'll ask everybody, like, what's the most important? And invariably, like everybody who was hired to be an SDR in the room says qualify. And I have them all argue it out. It's established credibility. Qualifying is the least important thing you can do on a call, right? It's, it's the lowest value use of your prospect's time. I get called all the time. And having someone figure out whether or not I'm important enough for them to talk to is not a very good use of my time. <laughs> You know, have, 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 having someone trying That's to figure terrible. out whether or not I use Salesforce is not a very, <laughs> not a very good use of my time, right? Yes. And if you earn credibility and you establish pain, that's a successful call to me. And every once in a while, you're going to get some false positives where you've had a really great conversation and they're not a good fit. And that's fine. You've just wasted 10 minutes, but you get to practice at a very high level in that situation. And what I tell the team is like, if you have a good, effective call, you can literally at the very end say, hey, while you're pulling up your calendar, there's a couple of qualifying questions I have to ask you, right? And it's getting people to focus on those things. Focus on establishing credibility. Focus on uncovering pain. Focus on having a high quality conversation. Because if you have a high quality conversation, if you earn credibility and build on that credibility over the course of the conversation, then you get to do a lot of the other things that are for you, not for your prospect. So I I love doing that, but then it's a matter of reinforcing that over time. Like once they actually get on the floor, once they actually start picking up the phone and making dials, reinforcing that over time. And one of the most effective things that I've done over the past year in my job has been to hire uh, a guy named Colin, Colin Waldrip, 
who started out as an SDR at Sales Loft and then moved into an SDR manager position. I hired him in February to take on the SDR trainer role. And he's done an incredible job with the SDRs. And he actually owns a lot of the SDR ramping right now for our organization. He works very closely with the managers. They have great relationships. And we've seen a lot better ramping times for our SDRs and just overall much higher quality conversations that are occurring as a result, I think, of his mentorship and the way he's worked with the managers. It's just been great so far. Interesting. So even, you know, focusing more in on that specific role with someone in enablement that's really focused on just that specific role, that's how deep you've gotten with this program. That's amazing. Yeah. When you think about what we do, I'm ashamed that I didn't do it before. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you really, I mean, it's funny because I used to sell sales training, you know, and so, you know, I was kind of the product and I had to do it perfectly every time, uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. And and you're in the same position, right? Because you, you're the enablement, you know, the sales engagement of record platform and you're the enablement guy. So, wow, no pressure, no pressure. All right. So the other thing that you mentioned I wanted to dive into was you look at the funnel metrics in the ongoing portion of your enablement program and you you start with process. So you start to look at the process. Why is that the most important and what is it you know, that makes you start with, okay, let's look at the process. In my experience, most of the time when there's an issue, there's a process problem. And the process could be fine and it could be people aren't adhering to the process. But if you put in place a process people don't adhere to, there's probably a problem with the process, right? That itself is a problem oftentimes. So process can hold you down or process can lift you up. And I want to create processes that can lift people up. If you get the process right, a lot of the other problems begin to go away. I use the analogy of a doctor a lot with our team. And I talk about how you know, your job is to, to diagnose situations because people often come to you with symptoms and those are the problems they're aware of, but there's an underlying condition that is really causing those problems. And I feel like that analogy also applies oftentimes in enablement where, you know, we might see that there's a symptom of a bad call conversion rate. You know, we see there's a symptom of too high of a number of activities to produce one one lead, for instance, or one opportunity. That's usually a process problem. Very often it's a process problem. You're doing something wrong in the process to create that. And by creating a more effective process, you can then train people on that process and how to execute it more effectively. It's kind of the container for everything else. The other reason I focus on process is because if you've got an inefficient or ineffective process, then anything you change within the context of that process is going to be inefficient and ineffective. So you're actually, you're doing a lot of work for a lot less results until you get your process right. Okay. So start there. So say somebody, you know, is, again, they're doing this on their own and they, they, they want a bigger picture look at their process. Where, where do you start with kind of unpacking your process and starting to look for places where there are, you know, choke points or you're having difficulties in the process. Yeah, you got to look at you know, this is actually something I intend to talk about at the conference. I'm going to talk oh. about I'm going to talk about testing, Excellent. right? Cuz everybody I want to figure out what the title is. I haven't figured that out yet, but it's the the whole idea is like everybody says they test but they don't. Okay. <laughs> or if they, or if they right. do it they do it wrong because testing is hard. It requires a pretty high level of discipline and it requires that you have access to a lot of data that a lot of people don't consistently have access to. Right. But if you, once you begin to get that process right, though, you can go and start looking systematically at the way prospects flow through your funnel from an SDR perspective. Right. And so I would look at, at the big one. The big one I want to look at is are people hitting their number? Is the organization across the board hitting this number from an opportunity production perspective? Right. And then I want to dig in and say, how many activities does it take to produce an opportunity? The more we can bring that number down, the better we are. In that situation, I want to keep the activities per opportunity number down, which is interesting because anecdotally from the conversations I've been having in the last few months since the coronavirus hit, that's gone up a lot across the board for most people, right? That's a big issue right now. It takes a lot of activities to produce 
one opportunity. And then I start looking at more detailed metrics. Like, so what's your reply rate? What is your pickup rate? What is your positive sentiment rate on your calls? What's your call conversion rate? At what stage during a cadence do you typically convert an opportunity? You know, is it, is it 12 touches? Is it nine touches? Whatever. And then just kind of systematically map the flow of prospects through your, your process and figure out where is it, where is it breaking? Where does it need to be improved? Where does it need to be optimized? And if there are several places where it looks like it's breaking, start with the one that's closest to the beginning because that's going to increase the flow to everything down. Tackle it. And so, you know, are these processes that you can plug into SalesLoft and run reports that tell you this? Do you have to have a sales engagement platform to be able to do this or can you do it in a spreadsheet if you're just starting out? You could do it in a spreadsheet. Oh, God. You could do it in a spreadsheet. It would be really, really hard. I probably would be too lazy to take the time to do it if I didn't have sales loft. <laughs> right. But it's better than sitting there and doing all these activities and just kind of winging it and not having any idea. I mean, a lot of people are out there, they're, they don't necessarily even have a process. You know, they, they've never you know, written down all the stages of the funnel that you're talking about to see how it's converting. So it's like, first you got to, have the process and then plug it into a tool like yours. Yeah, yeah. I actually pull most of the data from Salesforce, but the data itself is coming from SalesLoft into Salesforce. That's typically what I work from. And then you look at that once a week, once a month, every day. I mean, how often are you looking at that to see? I I look at it about once a month. You know, we have a VP of sales development named Jerry Praisman, who's doing a great job. I'm sure he work, looks at it constantly. And then I know Colin on my team looks at it pretty much near constantly because those are things that they directly own. So they're, they're on top of it all the time. But you know, looking at it every day, I don't think is super effective because there's going to be variability, right? You need to have kind of numbers over time to see what's working. We've actually been testing out a new cadence with... Actually, it's not even a new cadence. The cadence is part of it. It's a new approach with one of the SDR teams in our SMB segment, you know, for the first two or three weeks, it didn't look like it was very effective. And now that we're about six or seven weeks into it, they're actually blowing away the rest of the teams. They're doing a great job. And, you know, it takes time to, to really get data on testing sometimes. So you need to understand what the kind of time horizon is that you need to have effective data. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because a lot of this, it seems to come down to project management because it's really hard to understand what's working if you're not testing and then looking at the data, giving it enough time to, so that there's trends. And then somebody has to be like managing this whole project yeah. to make sure that, that there's, there's some, I mean, this is, you know, being from IBM, you probably were <laughs> inculcated with this, but a lot of people just kind of spin something up and then drop it and move to the next shiny object without having that consistency that you're talking about. I mean, that's, that's the number one reason for failure in most things. You know, I use the analogy of, of quitting smoking a lot of times. I've, I've done two really hard things in my life. One is I, I lost about 60 pounds over the course of about three months when I was younger in my life. And the other is I, I used to smoke two packs of Marlboro Reds every day. And this was years ago, but I quit smoking. And in doing those was, was the same thing both times, right? It's not like you decide to quit smoking and you're done and you never have to think about it again. It's a decision that you make over and over and over and over and over again. And it requires a certain level of discipline in order to affect change. And it's the same thing with something like testing. This is actually something I was talking to, to, to Colin about right before this call. The reason this test has been successful is because he and the manager of that team were both completely 100% bought in to testing this out. Even if it seemed like it wasn't working at first, they understood it's going to take a minute. And as a result of that, the reps were bought in, right? And this is something they decided they were going to pay attention to every day and execute every day over time. And it's because everybody had that discipline and everybody frankly trusted each other enough to, to give it a try that it worked. If you don't have that kind of trust, if you don't have that kind of discipline, if you don't have an effective culture at both the company level and the team level, things like this typically fall apart because people aren't committed to doing something hard over time. A hundred percent. I mean, a symptom of that is you hear a lot in the sales development world is, hey, I've tried everything. Nothing's working. 
you know, and because <laughs> you tried everything, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so, in your analogy, though, I mean, it's it's a really it's a really good analogy. So, with losing weight or quitting smoking or doing anything that's really really hard, it's so easy to kind of fall back into the bad habits and just sort of shrug your shoulders and lose motivation, you know, because it's like nothing's working, man, you know. Yeah, or you you tried it for two days and it didn't work, and you're like, well, <laughs> <laughs> like it wasn't the idea; it was your execution of the idea. Sometimes it takes a little while to get better, you know. And do you think you know is there a certain type of person that is more apt to really run these testing projects and make sure that you're dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's? Because it seems like that's a very analytical type of mentality to be able to really run this correctly? I think that type of person has to be involved, right? I don't know if you can have just that type of person. I think it takes different types of people to effectively execute these things, right? Because for every analytical person, you're probably also going to need kind of a, a motivational, charismatic person. And sometimes you're the same person. That's great. I wasn't blessed with both those skills. But, you know, you're, you're going to need you're going to need different types of people to affect change in an organization. That, that's what sales enablement really is, is, is change management. This organizational behavior is what sales enablement really is. Figuring out what the problem is, figuring out where the problem is, figuring out what you need to do to fix it. Those are all, frankly, the easy parts of sales enablement. Getting people to change what they do every day is really, really hard, right? And it takes it takes a lot of different types of people to get that to happen. You think about what it takes to just get yourself to change something. Now you got a whole <laughs> sales team <laughs> and salespeople are, are known for being, you know, headstrong. So, okay. So we've got this process. We're running these tests. We're starting to see, you know, better results. Now you move into training. That was your next, I don't know if you gave it to me in priority, but training. Yeah. Was training was the next one. one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now you can pinpoint what to train, right? Yep. And now you're training on typically the execution of the process, ideally, right? There's some skill development that is skill development outside or independent of the execution of the process. But but typically, if I'm going to train somebody on something, even if I'm trying to improve their skills, I'm trying to improve their skills in a specific way. A lot of times, this is where training goes wrong. People try to do training for general skills as opposed to training on how to execute this particular thing. If you focus on particulars, typically the general thing follows along, right? People need to have a very fine point of focus if they're going to be trained on skill development. Because if you don't do that, it gets lost, they get confused. It's difficult for them to judge the feedback they get on it, right? As opposed to them executing a specific thing over and over again until they get that right. Got it. And so this is something that you probably hear a lot is you've got your your A player, like your prima donnas, right? In the sales team, the prima donnas, the rainmakers. Do they need to be trained or do you just let them do whatever because whatever they're doing is working so great? And I think I yeah. know what you're going to say, but yeah, uh, they need to be trained. Okay. They need to be trained. <laughs> but why though? Cause they're making, you know, they're making all this money for the company for now. Yeah. You know, and also there's the other element of people like to feel invested in people want to be coached. This is one of the things that I've realized over and over again, especially top performers. They want to be coached. Now, a lot of times top performers say they want to be coached and they want to be acknowledged is what it really is or validated. And that's a, that's a, a whole other podcast that we could do, <laughs> but I want to have more. I mean, this is fascinating, but yeah, awesome. go ahead. People want to be coached and a lot okay. of times recognition and getting invested in is something that top performers really value a lot. Now, if somebody's really at the top of their game, one of the things that I like to do is to make them collaborators in what they want to focus on. You know, somebody who's new or somebody who's not very good yet a lot of times they'll say what they want to work on, but what they want to work on is not really what they need to work on because they don't know enough yet. They don't know enough to know what they need to work on. But a top performer, they do, right? You can have some real conversations with them if you develop some trust and figure out like, what's next for you? Like, what's the thing that's going to take you to the next level? Because what I don't want to happen, and this is what happens when people aren't coachable, you hit a ceiling. You know, human potential is not limitless, but it's, it's pretty damn close, to be honest with you. People can keep growing and keep doing some pretty amazing things over time if they put in the effort over time and they're intentional about the way they put in that effort. It's always frustrating when I, and I've seen it several times over my career where you've got reps who 
are really talented and they won't listen or they won't try new things and they won't accept coaching or try to engage in coaching and they hit a ceiling and that's it. That's it for them. They're not going to go any higher and they're going to level off and then they're going to get burned out and they're going to start trying to avoid challenges because those challenges give them uh, feedback that doesn't fit with their own self-perception, right? It makes them feel bad about themselves because they're so used to knocking it out of the park that when they don't, it makes them feel bad as opposed to people who are open to coaching and open to growth. Those people will continue to engage and recognize that they need to level up or try something different in order to get better. So I would, I would rather have the people who are, who are coachable. Okay. So we're getting into major psychology. I love it. I love <laughs> it. So have you ever, on the flip side of that, have you ever tried to train somebody? You, you had all the metrics, you trained them, you did everything. And finally, you're just like, you know what, dude, you're not cut out for sales. Like you should get into something else. Have you ever had that experience? Started a bunch. <laughs> I don't think I've ever said it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever just been like look buddy you know we anyways I, i'm just joking around but yeah i like to pull more than push from a training perspective all you can do is help develop awareness in people right you can create a space or create context in which people come to awareness about things and when it comes to people making decisions like that I can try to create the environment in which they become aware of that. You know, you start asking questions like, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you try this? Why, you know, and I've had situations where people tell me like, I don't think I want to be in sales. And I'm like, you know, well, tell me more about that. And, but I've never been the one to say it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's so hard because you've got bills to pay and you know, you're, you're, you're in this great opportunity, this great career, but deep down you're just like, I am not cut out for this man. You know? Yeah, it's it's miserable if you're in a job you don't like, especially something like sales. If you don't if you don't get off on on sales, it's going to be a hard career. It's be hard. <laughs> you know, oh, man. But it's got to be it's it's got to be frustrating for you to be training people, and you're just like, dude, no, there's yeah. no way. But, I use the analogy of the myth of Sisyphus. Are you familiar with the myth of Sisyphus? Is that a rolling the rock up the hill? Yeah, he, he tricks the gods. To- he tricks <laughs> okay. the gods. They condemn him to spend eternity rolling the rock <laughs> up the hill. And the rock rolls back down the hill and then he rolls it back up. And the whole point of the myth is that nothing's going to make you happy in life, right? There's always going to be more problems. There's always going to be more challenges. There's always going to be more unhappiness. And so you, you better fall in love with rolling rocks because that's what most of it is, right? And if you want to be happy, fall in love with rolling rocks. And it's the same thing about sales, right? Like you had a great month, fantastic. You're at zero. You're at zero right now. You know? <laughs> if you're yeah. an SDR, I hope you like making cold calls because that's what you're going to be doing, you know? Like let's have no illusions about that. That is the job and you can fall in love with it. You could treat it like a game, you know? Like there's a lot of stuff you can do, but you're going to be making cold calls. That's the job. You know? Yeah, it's amazing. It, it's and it's a great learning experience. I mean, because after you've done that for a couple of years, anything else you do is going to be super easy. So. Yeah, seriously, <laughs> seriously. But I, that's interesting. I never knew that that was the meaning of that that legend. It's learning to love the process and not be so laser focused on some mirage of a future that's going to be better, you know, yeah. uh, or something like yeah. that. Don't get tied to the outcome. Wow. Okay. Well, Sean, this has been mind blowing. I think we gave people the tools, you know, some tools that they can use if they don't have the blessing of an enablement person like yourself. And if you're running a big sales dev organization, I mean, this is some great information. So I want to thank you. I want to do this again. And also we'll see you at the conference in a few weeks. Thank you, David. I really enjoyed it. (laughs) All right. Thanks again, Sean, for coming on the Sales Development Podcast. If people want to connect with you, I see that you're on LinkedIn. What's the best way to connect? Yeah, LinkedIn, KS Fowler, or you can just look for LinkedIn, Sean Fowler, Sales Loft. I'm there. I'm a bald guy with glasses. (laughs) I like your glasses, by the way. Those are very Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Well, thanks again, Sean, and we'll talk again soon. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Sales Development Podcast. The only audio forum 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. 
If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.